In this tutorial, I'm going to be discussing how the Linear Accelerator, or LINAC, which is the workhorse of modern radiotherapy, manages to produce high-powered radiation beams. I'm going to be dividing this topic up over several videos. This one will discuss specifically how LINACs manage to achieve their high beam energies. X-ray tubes generate beam energy by accelerating electrons with a voltage applied between a cathode and a target. Generating a voltage like this is fairly straightforward and efficient at low energies, up to around about 300,000 volts. It's quite possible to apply this approach to higher energies up to a few million volts, and this has been done before, but it's quite technologically intensive and very inefficient. Linear accelerators offer a less straightforward but far more powerful approach to generating high beam energies using microwaves to generate electrical fields rather than directly applied voltage. Linux have a lot in common with radar, although they use high-powered microwaves for the acceleration of electrons rather than the detection of objects. Since Linux use microwaves to generate their beams, they require a high-powered microwave source. The type of source used depends upon the equipment manufacturer. Varying medical systems favor the klystron, and elector favor the magnetron. Klystrons are microwave amplifiers. They take a low-powered microwave signal and use an electron beam to convert it into a high-powered microwave signal. They were developed by the two Varian brothers, Russell and Sigurd, for use in aircraft detection via radar. Before we go on to discussing how the klystron works, there are a few things that you should know about microwaves. They're a form of electromagnetic radiation, like X-rays and visible light, but of a much lower energy. I've talked a lot in previous videos about high-energy photons acting like particles and slamming into things, but I'd like you to forget about that for a moment because microwaves behave very differently. They're basically oscillating electrical and magnetic fields that can move through space. All electromagnetic radiation is, which is why it's called electromagnetic radiation, but it's this feature of microwaves that's important to the rest of this discussion. Because microwaves have electrical and magnetic fields, they're able to move electrons around, which gives them the ability to generate voltage in the right geometry. And by the right geometry, I mean a cavity. In this context, a cavity means a hole inside a lump of metal. As microwaves pass through one of these cavities, they set up an oscillating electrical field. Basically, that means that at one moment it might be pointing in this direction, which might make this side of the cavity more negative, which will repel the electrons on this side of the cavity and cause them to move through the conductive wall over to this side. Because the field is oscillating, a short time later, the field will flip and begin to point this way, which might make this side more negative which will push these electrons back to the other side of the cavity. So as microwaves pass through this cavity, they cause electrons in the wall to move back and forth between the different ends of the cavity. If you have a beam of electrons entering one of these cavities that contains an oscillating electrical field, sometimes the nearest wall will be negative and will repel the incoming negative electrons, pushing them backwards slightly. As the field begins to flip, these electrons will move to the center of the cavity, and the wall will become neutral, allowing these electrons to pass into the cavity. As the field flips further, the opposite wall will become negative, which can push backwards on electrons passing through the cavity. But as the field flips backwards again, the wall behind these electrons becomes negative and will push them forward, encouraging them to move through the cavity. So how easily electrons are able to make it through this cavity depends upon the time at which they arrive. If they're repelled as they enter the cavity, they won't be able to enter as easily but if they're repelled by this wall when they're already inside the cavity, they'll get a slight boost. The same is true when they come close to the opposite wall. If this wall is negative when they're close to the wall, they'll be pushed backwards. But if the wall is positive, they'll be encouraged to move forward. Effectively what this means is that electrons are only allowed to move through these cavities in bunches, since they have to move through at the right time. So moving an electron beam through a cavity like this, which we call a bunch of cavity, is the first step in amplifying microwaves within a klystron. The way that a bunch of cavity bunches an incident beam of electrons is by initially discouraging the entry of the beam by having a negative wall in the way. The oscillation of the electrical field causes the entry wall to become less negative and allow the beam to pass through. When the exit wall becomes negative, it repels the incident beam, causing the leading electrons to slow down. When the entry wall becomes negative again due to field oscillation, it blocks more electrons from entering, cutting the initial electron bunch off from the beam. It also repels the electrons at the end of the bunch, causing them to speed up, which allows them to catch up with the rest of the electrons from this chopped portion of beam. Because the electrons at the front of this beam segment had been slowed down when the exit wall was negative, and the electrons at the back of the beam segment were sped up when the entry wall was negative, the two ends of this beam segment will converge as it travels, forming a small distinct bunch of electrons. This is why it's called a bunch of cavity. A klystron contains at least one more cavity. Some have more than one, but I'm going to discuss a simplified model which only has two. These are connected by a tube that allows electron bunches to pass from one to the other. The whole thing is vacuum sealed to stop the electrons from losing energy via interacting with the air. Both the bunch of cavity and this catcher cavity, as it's called, are fed with microwaves, which set up that oscillating electrical field. The field in the bunch of cavity forms an electron beam into electron bunches. Their release is timed such that when they enter the catcher cavity, 
they encounter an opposing microwave-generated electrical field, which forms because the back wall becomes negative. This opposing field slows the electron bunches down, so they lose energy, and all energy has to go somewhere, so the electron's kinetic energy in this case is given to the microwave-generated electrical field. So it's given to the microwaves, which bumps up their power considerably. They can then be taken out of the clastron and fed into other components of the linear accelerator. So basically, low-power microwaves go in and are used to generate electron bunches, the electron bunches then interact with low-powered microwaves and convert them into high-powered microwaves, which then leave the classroom. So the low-powered microwaves go in, and high-powered microwaves go out. High-powered microwaves are generated within the classroom, but they need to make their way to the accelerating waveguide before they can be used to generate a beam. They move from A to B via a radio frequency or RF waveguide. An RF waveguide is a microwave equivalent of an electrical wire in that it conducts them from one place to another. In this context, it's a hollow copper tube filled with an insulating gas. In Varian Linux, this is SF6, or sulfur hexafluoride. This stops the electrical fields generated by the high-powered microwaves from causing arcing as they pass through the guide. It's heavier than air, so it can displace the oxygen within a room and pose an asphyxiation risk if too much is released. It also has minor anesthetic properties and is one of the most powerful greenhouse gases known to man, being about 20,000 times more potent by weight than carbon dioxide. The gas pressure within the RF waveguide needs to be maintained above a certain level in order to keep it insulated, and the low pressure may cause the Linux to stop working, so if you get a gas interlock when using the machine, this is probably why. An accelerating waveguide is a tube that allows microwaves to set up electrical fields and accelerate an electron beam. It's not all that dissimilar to a clastron in that it's composed of microwave cavities, except this time they're used to speed up electron bunches rather than slow them down. The design is essentially a metal tube divided up into cavities with a central channel to allow an electron beam to pass through the middle. The tube is evacuated in order to avoid losing electron energy by passing the beam through air. Generally speaking, accelerating waveguides function by using microwaves to set up electrical fields within the cavities, and these fields are used to accelerate bunches of electrons. There are two basic designs, traveling wave and standing wave. Varian medical systems use standing wave accelerators, and Elector use traveling wave accelerators. In a traveling wave accelerator, electron bunches and microwaves are fed into the same end of the accelerating tube. When microwaves travel through the waveguide, they produce an electrical field with a shape a bit like this. Over a certain distance, which is known as a wavelength, they produce a positive and a negative peak. At this point, the electric field is very weak in that direction. At that point, it's very strong in that direction. This point is weak again. This point is zero. This point is weak in that direction. At this point here, it's strong in that direction. At this point is zero again. What this means is that as microwaves travel through the guide, the field in this direction will increase as these microwaves pass through, but by the time this part of the wave moves into the next section of the guide, increasing the field in that direction, the field in this first cavity will be reversed. So over time, fields pointing in this direction will move through the guide, followed one cavity behind by fields pointing in the other direction. So if you insert an electron bunch into the first cavity when the electric field is pointing in the direction you want it to go, and the bunch moves at the same speed as the microwaves down the guide, it can essentially catch this field like a wave and ride it down the guide, being accelerated as it goes. Essentially, you're trying to drop the electron bunch into the first cavity when the strongest part of the microwave field is traveling through it, because a stronger field means more acceleration and therefore more energy being given to your electrons. But if you wait too long and this field's moved on to the next cavity, your electron bunch will be decelerated by an opposing field. So to recap, in a traveling wave accelerator, electrons and microwaves are fed into one end, and we insert electron bunches at just the right time to ride accelerating fields down the guide. The design of a standing wave accelerator can be quite simple to that of a traveling wave accelerator, except this time the microwaves are piped in halfway along the waveguide, but the electron bunches still end up in the end. The effect of inserting microwaves halfway along the guide is that they tend to move in both directions, bounce off the most distant walls, and move back towards the middle. This happens on both sides. So this means that in every cavity you have microwaves moving this way and microwaves moving this way, and the electric fields of the two overlap. This is known as a standing wave. This is illustrated by this animation. So the blue wave here is moving from right to left, just like a traveling wave would be in the accelerator that I drew on the previous slide, and the red wave is moving from right to left. So notice that as the two waves overlap, they add together and cancel out. This diagram here represents the strength of the fields within the cavities. In accelerating waveguides and standing waveguides in particular, the size of the cavities is closely related to the size of the microwave wavelength. So the cavities are positioned like this. In cavities like these two, the field varies a lot over time. In cavities like these two, it doesn't change much at all, because the waves here tend to cancel out, whereas the waves in these two here tend to overlap and reinforce. So in the waveguide itself, this translates to, in this cavity here, two overlapping fields pointing in the same direction. In this cavity, you have two electric fields pointing in opposite directions. So they cancel out and add to zero. In this cavity, you have two electric fields pointing in this direction, so the opposite direction to the ones in the first cavity. 
and this cavity is another with an effective field of zero. As time passes and the waves travel slightly, you notice that the field in this cavity flips, but it still has two overlapping fields pointing in the same direction. In the waveguide, this means that you have two fields that are now pointing in this direction. So compared with slightly earlier, the field is the same strength but pointing the other way. In this cavity, the field is still effectively zero. This is what we call a node cavity, because on a wave diagram like this, a node is a point that doesn't move. And in this context, a node cavity is a cavity that doesn't have an electric field that affects electron motion. In this cavity, the electric field is also flipped to point the other direction. So at any given time in a standing wave accelerator, odd-numbered cavities will have electric fields pointing in opposite directions. If we insert an electron bond when the timing is right, when the field in this first cavity is strong and pointing in the direction we want the electrons to go, the field will give the electrons a push. It will add energy and accelerate them. But the field in the next cavity will be pointing in the opposite direction. But it takes the electron bunch a little bit of time to cross this next cavity, which doesn't have an electric field that affects the electrons. But by the time the electron bunch reaches the next accelerating cavity, the field is flipped, so it's able to give the electron bunch another push and add some more energy. And the fields in front and behind it are now pointing in the opposite direction. But once again, by the time the electrons reach the next accelerating cavity, the field has flipped, allowing it to give the electrons another push and add still more energy. So if electron bunches are inserted at the right time and the right speed, they're bumped from cavity to cavity with a little more energy added each time, and they can come out the other end of the waveguide with a very high energy. As I mentioned already, microwaves passing through a standing wave accelerator only result in oscillating magnetic fields in every second cavity. The cavities in between, known as node cavities, have no net magnetic field. This brings us to one of the strengths of the standing wave accelerator design, is that the accelerator tube can be shortened by moving these node cavities off to the side. As far as I can tell, the physics behind why this is possible isn't clinically relevant anywhere in the radiotherapy field, so I'm not going to cover it. But this allows the cavities with the oscillating magnetic fields to be placed next to each other, shortening the length of the waveguide as a whole. This can allow us to generate higher beam energies with a given length of waveguide, since beam energy increases with the number of accelerating cavities that a beam passes through. Or it can allow us to construct smaller and more lightweight accelerators, which are easier and less expensive to house in a hospital. To reiterate, using a waveguide to accelerate electrons requires that they be inserted at exactly the right time and velocity. There's only a brief window during which they'll be accepted and accelerated through the guide. In traveling wave accelerators, you can liken this to a surfer attempting to catch a wave. They have to be paddling just fast enough at just the right time in order to catch it. In a standing wave accelerator, you can visualize it as trying to run through some of these. Running at the wrong time or at the wrong speed will end badly. So this means that they can only accelerate little packets of electrons, so only a bunch at a time. So before electrons enter the accelerating waveguide, we need to pre-bunch them and speed them up. We could do this with bunching cavities like we discussed with the klystron, or with a particular design of electron gun. If we apply a high voltage to the electron gun in the order of tens of thousands of volts, we can accelerate electrons within the gun so they're traveling fast enough when they enter the accelerator. The electron gun can also contain a grid which allows us to bunch the electrons. When the grid is turned off, it allows electrons to pass through. When it's turned on, it's negatively charged, and repulsion stops the beam from passing through allowing us to cut up our beam into little packets. Both standing and traveling wave accelerators require electron bunching. This means that electrons only leave the waveguide in little packets or pulses, which results in beams that are pulsed as well. This is distinct from X-ray tube or gamma ray beams which aren't pulsed, they produce continuous beams of radiation. So if we look at a LINAC beam, the dose versus time will look a bit like this. Sharp, peaks, doses. So the instantaneous dose rate during these pulses is extremely high. If we compare this to the dose output of an X-ray machine, it's much lower but much more consistent. So continuous beams have a much lower instantaneous dose rate. We normally use linear accelerators at a dose rate of 600 MeV per minute, or 6 gray per minute. This is the dose rate averaged over a relatively large amount of time. The actual dose will be delivered in many, many high dose packets per second. You can't just plug a LINAC into the wall and expect it to work. 240 volts isn't enough to get the thing going. So in a treatment room, you'll see a little cabinet close to the LINAC itself. This is called the modulator. It houses a pulse forming network, which basically takes low voltage power from the wall and stores it as massive charges, which can be released as high voltage pulses into the machine. So this is responsible for the 100,000 volt pulses that the Clastron needs in order to accelerate electrons and act as a microwave amplifier. The waveguide can also only accelerate fairly energetic electrons as well. These are accelerated into the waveguide by the electron gun. The tens of thousands of volts needed for this process are provided by the pulse forming network as well. The RF waveguide carries high-powered microwaves from the klystron to the waveguide. The beam is formed by accelerating electrons from the electron gun through the accelerating waveguide. It's a brief preview of what I'm going to be talking about in the next tutorial. You'll notice that this beam isn't pointing at the patient. 
So we have a bending magnet system that uses magnetic fields to bend the beam to face the patient. And depending on what we want the beam to do, the treatment head, which is everything below the bending magnet, has components that allow us to make the beam clinically useful. That's going to be the topic of another tutorial.